Yes, it's all yours. Oh, th thank you, friends, for joining. Uh, today's topic basically is whether a large-scale violence, bloodshed, is possible in India before 2024 election. Now, that's not the kind of uh, wording that we can put on social media, uh, whether there can be a civil war or worse. Um, so th that's why we put uh, mild uh, words which would be acceptable in social media, uh, but uh, uh, we don't need to beat around the bush and uh, talk, have a very straightforward conversation uh, this morning, uh, because th this is serious. The question can be put in many different ways. Um, a simple question today is, could the government of India murder head of a Gurudwara in Canada, um, Hardeep Singh Nijar, the Prime Minister of Canada last Monday on September 18th, he said that the government of India did it. They have proof, evidence, which they have shared with um, the NATO ally, allies. And therefore, the uh, Canadian government has expelled the uh, Indian ambassador from Canada and India has retaliated by expelling the Canadian um, uh, diplomat from Delhi. So is the government of India capable of murdering people without charging them, <clears throat> formally without trying them, uh, without doing, without the due process of law? Well, the same question has been very much up in the media, whether the government of Haryana, BJP government of Haryana, could uh, honor, support, give weapons to Moni, Monu Manesar, who killed, burnt alive two Muslim men, claiming that they uh, were cow smugglers. Now, uh, Monu's real name is Monu uh, Mohit Yadav. Uh, in 2016, he became very popular when he posted on social media, beating up two Muslim men, forcing them to eat cow dung. The BJP government in Haryana honored him, uh, made him recognized. Uh, the, the force uh, as Gao Rakshaks, the vigilantes who are supporting the police to protect cows, uh, prevent cow smuggling. Now, uh, in February 23 is when he, uh, so, 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 he, so he was armed, he was being photographed by VIPs, including the Home Minister Amit Shah, uh, so th this was uh, increasing his global clout with the Hindus on social media, making him a terror in, uh, uh, to the Muslims. Uh, after he um, um, burnt alive, so, so he, 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 beat the, he arrest, uh, kidnapped these two Muslim young men in February 23, beat them up, um, and they, when they were almost dying, he took them to the police station that these are cow smugglers and they should be prosecuted. But because they were virtually dead, the police refused to take them. So he took them in a car and burned them alive uh, with his gang. Now, uh, is so then he disappeared. He was in Thailand. Uh, having a good life, uh, who was paying for him to enjoy the um, massages and luxury in Thailand? Well, he felt he, he had such, such a support uh, in 
from the political and uh, financial sources of uh, resourceful Hindus that he came back and organized uh, a month ago the riots in uh, um, Haryana um, uh, where, where at least six people were killed. A lot of damage was done. One Maulana Imam was killed in a mosque. Uh, finally, after G20, when the pressure came from the Muslim governments, the crown prince of uh, 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 Saudi Arabia, then the police acted promptly, arrested him. But uh, he was arrested in Haryana, but sent to Rajasthan uh, so that if uh, the Congress pol uh, police, the police under Congress in Rajasthan, prosecutes him, uh, then it is the Congress that gets blamed amongst the Hindus uh, and the Haryana government doesn't get blamed because um, uh, it, uh, he, he was being supported by the Haryana government. Uh, but it had the, the fact that somebody could burn alive two Muslim youth uh, without proving that they have done any cow smuggling um, th this is what he is charging. The fact that he burned them alive, he beat them, that is well established through the uh, videos that they themselves made and, uh, and broadcast in order to become more popular and also to terrorize Muslims. So the, it is in this context <clears throat> where uh, Satpal Malik's uh, statement uh, repeated statements <clears throat> that before 2024 election, they can do anything. They meaning Hindutva forces, they can do anything. Uh, he has said that they can bomb uh, the um, Ram Mandir. Almost they are trying to bring five crores, 50 million people to inaugurate the Ram Mandir in Ayodhya, which was built by um, demolishing the Babri Mosque. So Babri Mosque was de demolished and now the mandir is built. It's still receiving finishing touches. Uh, but from this month, end of September till the 15th of October, the Vishwa Hindu Parishad is going into five lakhs, that's uh, 500,000 villages, to mobilize um, uh, 50 million uh, five crore people to come to Ayodhya, which will be the official launch of the, uh, at least at the moment, uh, elections can happen before that. Uh, but at the moment, the thought is that that is when the BJP's campaign for election will be launched. Uh, but um, Satpal Malik and Satpal Malik was appointed by the BJP as governor of Jammu and Kashmir before that in Goa, Meghalaya, Bihar, and Odisha. So he has been an insider in BJP and he knows how they think or what they plan, what they do. And he's answering the question straightforward Can the BJP create Large scale, large scale bloodshed to win the 2024 election. Uh, he, he's at the moment he's not going far enough, but he said he will say a lot more once the elections are actually announced. Um, now, Uddhav Thakre was the chief minister of uh, Maharashtra, a, an ally of the BJP. He has repeated the same charge that uh, before the 2024 election, particularly in connection with the inauguration of the Ram Temple, uh, in which Prime Minister Modi is supposed to participate on the 25th of January, that's a day before uh, the Republic Day on the 26th, um, that as these um, buses, trucks, trains carrying the pilgrims return, uh, we can expect Godra too. Godra uh, was the incident 
uh, which in which Muslims were massacred in uh, Gujarat, and uh, the chief minister of Gujarat was launched on his uh, campaign to become the prime minister of India. So uh, the BBC made the documentary accusing uh, Mr. Narendra Modi, the prime minister, who was then the chief responsible for that massacre. Uh, and that documentary was played uh, in, in the U.S. before uh, Modiji went there recently. It was played in the parliament in Australia. <clears throat> but the reality is, <clears throat> and this is what we really need to understand today, that post-Christian West, Biden, uh, Trudeau, the chief and the prime ministers of Australia, etc., they don't really believe in human rights. Uh, they still have to pay lip service to human rights. But what has really empowered Modi and Amit Shah uh, is the fact that what the West cares for is not uh, that India, whether India respects or does not respect human rights, but whether India is powerful, uh, whether it's a huge market, whether it is a potential ally against China, which at the moment is feared as the most important threat to the West. Uh, so uh, cultivate India, uh, overlook the uh, human rights violations, because uh, the United Nations, Mrs. Roosevelt, uh, 1948 uh, has deceived the U.S., deceived the whole world into thinking that human rights are universal. Uh, there are no universal human rights. Uh, there is no universal concept, self-evident concept of human equality and human dignity. These were peculiar products of biblical worldview which were secularized in the West uh, because the Declaration of Independence in 1776 made it very clear that the truth that all men are created equal is a sacred truth and that all men are endowed by uh, with rights to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness the, uh, by their creator. Uh, that was the biblical worldview behind uh, the emphasis on human rights, as the American church, Western Christianity, made itself impotent and decided not to disciple nations, not to educate nations, um, not to cultivate the conscience, but hand over education to the state, to secularism, the found intellectual foundations for human rights are gone. And the BJP knows this well, uh, that what matters to American presidents, whether Trump or Biden, is uh, not whether or not Modi uh, is responsible for mass murders, but whether uh, Modi represents a powerful country, economically powerful, militarily powerful. That's what really builds his uh, reputation. And they would salute him with 21 guns, uh, even though at first, when Godra one happened, uh, his visa was suspended. He was not allowed to travel to the USA for years until he became the prime minister and President Obama withdrew uh, that ban on Modi's travel. So uh, we will return to this, but I will be touching a lot of subjects and a lot of topics. But the essential point that you need to take with you today is very simple, that freedom does not come from constitution. Freedom comes from conscience. Conscience is the source of modern political freedoms. England has no constitution, but England is considered the mother of modern democracy. Uh, this is where the freedoms were first institutionalized because of the biblical doctrine of conscience, not because there was a constitution. Uh, so there was no written constitutions, but freedom came. 
Now, Indians are putting their trust in constitution, uh, but constitution is a bothersome document for Hindutva. So one of the reasons for turning India into Hindu Rashtra, uh, uh, they, they are uh, embarrassed about the word Hindu also, they as uh, because it's not an Indian word. There is no uh, scripture, Vedas, Upanishads, uh, epics, uh, Puranas, which describe Hinduism as Hindu. The, the word Hindu is of Persian origin. It began as a geographic word of the people who are living uh, near Sindh River. So because they can't, couldn't pronounce S, so, Sindhu became Hindu or Hindu uh, in traveling from Persia to Greek, uh, Greece. Um, uh, but uh, so the, the people living around the Sindh River and their beliefs and their gods and goddesses, they began to be lumped together as Hindu. Uh, but the idea of Hinduism, uh, the word Hinduism uh, was, is a European word coined by European Indologist in the 18th century. So um, the, 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 you know, I'm going to take some rabbit trails uh, and I hope you can keep all of this together. But even if you forget a lot of it, if this is being recorded, you can hear it second time. But the essential point in this lecture today is that Conscience is the source of freedom, and I will demonstrate that, not constitution. Constitution is an expression of a worldview which is supposed to protect and defend individual conscience. Um, and this is the conflict with Canada right now. If a, um, a Sikh in Canada, Sikh leader, president of a Gurudwara, believes that Punjab should become an independent nation? Does he have the right to speak? Can he be killed uh, for uh, speaking what he sincerely believes? Now, he might be wrong. If he's wrong, are we supposed to answer him and are Sikhs supposed to answer him uh, with uh, their reasons and their evidence that why he's wrong? Or should he be eliminated? Does he have an inalienable fundamental right to life, which cannot be taken away by a government without the due process of law. Uh, so the constitution acknowledges the fundamental right to life, inalienable right to life, but then in practice, why is it that BJP would, or Hindutva forces would honor uh, uh, a monu uh, who burns alive two Muslim young men and financially support him to take a holiday in uh, Thailand to avoid the police, uh, but then help him to come back to Haryana uh, to create riots uh, as a prelude to what's going to happen before the 24 election, uh, but arrest him, dump him, uh, only under pressure from Saudi Arabia that, look, you act on this, uh, otherwise uh, be prepared for Hindus to be treated in Muslim countries in the Middle East the way you are treating Muslims here. That was the threat because of which uh, he was arrested and is being tried now. Um, um, so uh, the the second important point that I'm going to make, I'm going to take several rabbit trails, but the second important point that I'm going to make is that conscience is what has been killed in India. India is capable of doing this. Uh, Satyapal Malik and Uddhav Thakre, and repeated by Prashant Bhushan and many others, these people are saying that we should prepare for the worst. They can do anything that, that that statement from Satyapal Malik, a BJP governor, uh, that means that they have no conscience. That's what Satyapal Malik is saying. 
The conscience has been killed. So the question is, the second question is, what killed the conscience? How did this idea of conscience come into India? And what has killed the conscience? And my answer is uh, that Bhagavad Gita silenced uh, the conscience of Oppenheimer. And that's why this uh, lecture is titled Oppenheimer, Conscience and Manipur. Uh, that we've heard the reports. These reports are not yet verified in courts with uh, uh, evidence and arguments. Uh, so these are still allegations. Uh, but for uh, two women to say that the police uh, offered them protection, but handed them over to a mob, Hindu mob, who uh, killed their father and their brother, uh, um, uh, and uh, both older brother and younger brother, and stripped them, abused them, raped them, killed one, one of the three women. Uh, how is it possible for the police to do this? What has really killed the conscience? These are religious mobs who have political patronage. They are private militia, like Bajrang Dal, except in the case of Manipur, these are private militias that the present chief minister has built up. And uh, uh, the, so how can you have um, uh, the, uh, large mobs uh, killing father, son, uh, stripping, abusing, raping, uh, helpless women killing uh, one of them after raping her. How is it possible for the Indian conscience uh, to uh, come to this point that uh, they are saying, of course, that 4,000 or 5,000 uh, sophisticated weapons were stolen, uh, but uh, many of the um, people on social media, they are saying that these weapons were not stolen. They were given by the police to Hindu militia that are sponsored by the chief minister himself. Uh, he has resigned as the patron uh, when the ri riots began, but he built up these militias. Uh, that's uh, the allegations being made. So the, uh, the weapons were given, but the weapons are useless if you're not giving them training. So not only the weapons were given, but the training was given. And the question is that is Manipur only the trailer of what the government of India, Hindutva movement, uh, can do, will do to the whole nation? Well, the fact is that if um, uh, 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 the, the, the discussion of the names and uh, uh, Dianity Stalin's argument that uh, Sanatan Dharm is uh, a disease like malaria or HIV or cancer or leprosy. Uh, this is not to be opposed. This is to be eradicated. Uh, how can he make such strong statements? And I'm helping you to understand the, uh, uh, well, obviously, if you soften what he's saying, uh, he, he is saying that a religious system cannot keep 60, 70, 80, 85 of the po population as low caste for centuries, for thousands of years, uh, abuse them, keep them as low caste. Unless uh, it is a system without a conscience. Um, and what has destroyed that conscience? And this is where Oppenheimer is important because Oppenheimer, the movie, Robert Oppenheimer was the physicist, uh, for those who may not remember, who is deemed to be the father of the atom bomb. He was. Um, uh, appointed the director of the Manhattan Project that was commissioned to build a bomb. Uh, now, the movie doesn't actually talk much about the bomb, nor does it, nor does it show 
the bomb uh, being thrown on Nagasaki and Hiroshima at the end of World War II. Uh, most of the movie is very boring in that it is the debate whether uh, Oppenheimer himself was a communist who may have leaked or his girlfriend may have leaked um, the uh, secrets of bomb making to Russia because Russia was at that point the main communist uh, rival. And uh, although the war was against Germany and uh, um, Japan, uh, the fear was that because behind the hot war, World War II, a cold war is going on, and the long term, Russia is the real enemy of the USA. The uh, fear that haunted Oppenheimer was that is he building a bomb which would be uh, duplicated by Russia? And will this bomb start a chain reaction that will destroy the world? Now, thankfully, that has not happened. We came very close to a full-fledged nuclear war, a war uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, which was averted. Uh, but the basic fear that Oppenheimer had, uh, which gave him nightmares, uh, is valid because the bomb, as I said last week, uh, is not just a Russia-American problem, but North Korea has a bomb, Pakistan has bombs, India has bombs, and the rivalry of Hindu-Muslim rivalry could lead to uh, uh, what Oppenheimer really feared, large-scale destruction of uh, millions and millions of people being killed in India and Pakistan, or in India alone. Uh, because, as I said last week, uh, who is better armed, uh, Goliath or David, is irrelevant. Who strikes first is the issue. Uh, Pakistan has had a tradition of military uh, takeover, that the elected democratic government is thrown out in 75 years. Only one government, Mrs. Benazir Bhutto's husband, uh, late Mrs. Putto's husband, he's the only one who survived five years as an elected uh, prime minister before he was thrown out. Every other government in Pakistan has ended in assassination, coups, civil war, uh, etc. Uh, could Taliban, could a militant uh, Muslim who has a conscience like um, Osama bin Laden or uh, Baghdadi, could he organize a military coup in Pakistan, take over the nuclear weapons, and launch a strike against India? You know, the, Pakistan has the capacity to launch some of these uh, deadly missiles from uh, uh, submarines in the um, Arabian Gulf. Uh, Indian Ocean, Bay of Bengal. Um, so they're not just fixed locations from where these bombs uh, can be sent. Uh, and if you send 10, 15, 20 bombs at the same nuclear weapons at the same time, uh, within half an hour uh, of striking a sufficient uh, uh, capital, will it kill millions of Muslims? Yes. But does uh, and Osama bin Laden care whether there is a Muslim woman in New York who has uh, put her child in daycare and gone into the trade towers to do her work, to earn her living. And as uh, the, uh, these commercial passenger jets hit the Twin Towers in New York, the Muslims will be killed. Civilian Muslims will be killed. Uh, does Osama bin Laden care for it? No. Once your conscience is dead, um, conscience has been effectively silenced, 
uh, it doesn't really matter how many Muslims you will kill as long as you're destroying uh, Delhi and you're destroying uh, important military bases in India. So that's the worst kind of situation. Now, Seth Pal Malik is not talking about what Pakistan might do. Uddhav Thakir is not talking about what Pakistan could do. They're talking about what Hindutva can do uh, in India before the next election. And this is where we want, need to understand the concept of conscience of how secular education, both in the West and in India, has destroyed the concept of uh, conscience, the notion of conscience, the respect for conscience, um, which is what has brought our police to the level that we are hearing about in Manipur, that, that you now have a police force without a conscience. And so, so that's the, uh, I want us to understand what was the, con the uh, why was Oppenheimer's conscience so deeply troubled by the thought and whether this was naive or whether his fears were legitimate and that this could actually happen and that it could, it, if it doesn't begin with between America and Russia, this could begin between India and Pakistan. It would not be Pakistan as a nation because uh, Muslim theology has no concept of nation. Uh, this would be Hindu versus Muslim. So the nuclear bomb, uh, 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 the concept of nation is a Jewish Protestant concept imposed upon the whole world after World War II. Uh, but uh, the Muslim concept of caliphate uh, there is, uh, after 1924, Turkey was the, ca the caliphate, uh, but Ottoman Empire, but once it was defeated at the end of World War I, uh, caliphate ended. But should caliphate be revived, or should the Muslim world adhere to a Western, which is biblical, Pro Jewish, Protestant idea. It's not a Roman Catholic idea. Nation is not a Roman Catholic idea. Nation is not a Orthodox Christian idea. It is a peculiar Jewish, Protestant idea, which uh, I've discussed in one of my books and might make some comments again. Uh, but this is not a Muslim idea, although today the Muslims accept it, even including in the Middle East, uh, but they accept it because it suits different sheikhs to uh, be uh, ruling Qatar or the UAE or uh, these little nations, Kuwait. Uh, they don't want to be under a uh, caliphate run from Saudi Arabia or Turkey or Iran, Persia. Uh, they want uh, their kingdom. So the idea of nation is supported on pragmatic grounds by Muslim leadership of each nation, but Muslim theology doesn't support the concept of nation. Uh, that's why Baghdadi and uh, Osama bin Laden, they, they don't accept the concept of nation and uh, national sovereignty. And uh, what Modiji is showing, if this is allegation is true, that India is sending its mercenaries to go into Canada and kill uh, a man, uh, extrajudicial murder, then Hindutva has no concept of nation either. So the talk of Akhand Bharat is a violation of uh, respecting the borders, international borders, because that's not part of Hindu philosophy, Hindu theology. The whole concept of uh, Ashwamedh Yagya was to take your neighbor's borders to take take your neighbor's territories, and uh, so uh, so the the idea of nation respecting international borders. Uh, this is a peculiar biblical idea, uh, which uh, uh, Islam and Hinduism do not really accept. Although nobody has a choice right now, but to live uh, with the reality of nation uh, that has. Uh, come upon the whole world as a result of the Protestant movement, 
but that's a long discussion which uh, I'll be glad to have uh, during Q and A. But let's return to the uh, 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 the second important point: that could India be plunged into large-scale bloodbath? What Thakre is saying is that as these buses, trucks, trains, cars, taxis return from Ayodhya after 25th of January, after inaugurating the Ram Mandir, uh, they could plunge much of North India into Manipur-style violence. Now, both Thakre and Malik are uh, speaking about uh, this violence intended to polarize Hindu voters against Muslim voters to win the next election. That all other issues of poverty, unemployment, hunger, price of still a gas cylinder, all of these things should be forgotten. Uh, only the election should be on religious grounds. And uh, the, uh, a section of Hinduism is very happy that uh, um, uh, Udayanidhi Stalin, by attacking Sanatan, has uh, fired the first shot that, that Sanatan needs to be eradicated. So let's make that an election issue. Though they know pretty well that this election issue could actually hurt the BJP uh, in the north big time uh, because Akhilesh Yadav's slogan of PDA, of Pichla, this backward caste, OBC, uh, Dalit, and Alp Sankhya, minorities, which is Muslim, largely Muslim voters in North, uh, in UP. So bring together Pichla, this was of course Kanshi Ram's vision, uh, but right now um, Akhilesh Yadav has championed it and it has proven successful in Ghosi by-election. Uh, to unite uh, PDA, Pichlavar, OBC, Dalit, Alpsankhet, minorities, and this is a winning coalition. And they, uh, none of them, really care for Sanatan. So this is where I was making a, uh, a detour into a rabbit trail that uh, what this whole controversy that changed in the name of India to Bharat, uh, which is um, an important controversy. The government is supporting it, if not leading it. Uh, the, uh, the, the fact is that I had made a video, a number of videos are available on YouTube. I had made a video more than a year ago uh, that the name India came from Latin Bible. Now, that's not saying that the uh, Persians and the Greeks didn't use. Uh, Hindu or Hindu, they did. But nobody in India was reading Greeks. And it's not because of Greeks uh, that uh, India uh, chose the name India. So even if the or origin was Persian and Greek, uh, Persian and Greeks didn't uh, make India India. It was the Latin Bible's use of the word India in the book of Esther, which stimulated explorers such as Columbus and Vasco da Gama to go out and look for India and look for the sea route to India. So uh, European fascination with India as the end of the world, it was the end of the Persian Empire in the Book of Esther, but in their minds it was end of the world, the exotic place. Um, that was triggered by, uh, by, by the Bible. But again, uh, Columbus and uh, Vasco da Gama didn't uh, make the Constituent Assembly adopt the name India. The Constituent Assembly adopted the name India uh, largely because William Carey's paper, The Friend of India, uh, conceived the modern concept of India as a nation state was never there in any Hindu scripture, philosopher, sage, or political ruler. This was a concept which took shape in Fort William College where civil servants were being trained. Kerry was there in 
uh, Fort William College in Calcutta three days a week teaching civil servants, uh, but mainly translating the Bible into Indian languages. So the pundits who were translating the Bible, they were hired by East India Company uh, to teach languages to English civil servants. And uh, they were being used to turn oral dialects. So somebody is going into Gujarat, a, a, an English a young man, 23 year old, as the deputy collector or magistrate, he needs to know Gujarati, but there is no Gujarati textbook. So uh, translate the Bible into Gujarati so that he both can learn Gujarati as well as learn how God wants his will to be done on the earth. How are we to govern Gujarat? Uh, there is no constitution at that point. There is no Indian penal code at that point. So how should we administer justice, uh, righteousness in, um, in Gujarat or any other part of India? The, the, these were the issues because of which the, as the uh, languages are being developed at Fort William College, the books, the Bibles are printed in Sarampur because the press is there. And later, when the East India Company objects to their college being used for Bible translation, then the British and Foreign Bible Society established. It's the same people, the evangelicals who are controlling East India Company, who start the Bible Society, uh, and the same evangelical members of parliament who become governors of the, uh, the, the Bible Society, and they begin to finance the translation of the Bible through which all of Indian languages develop, but not just Indian languages develop, but the concept of a nation state comes from the Bible and the concept of how this nation should be a nation built run on justice and righteousness, because those are the foundations of the throne of God. All of these ideas are injected into India's soul in uh, the Fort William College. So th this is, of course, the theme of a number of my books and a number of other chapters, which will now be published as uh, at least three volumes on how the Bible created modern India. But to, to summarize this point, yes, the name India is not an Indian name. It came from Latin Bible. And the, but Latin Bible was talking about geography, the concept of a geopolitical nation state was developed in Calcutta, and the name India was given to this vision uh, through William Carey's paper, uh, The Friend of India. The name Hindu was also coined by a uh, British uh, European Indologist. That's why they prefer the name Sanatan. But Sanatan is also not a Hindu name. Sanatan was a Buddhist term, which any Besant, a theosophist, uh, she injected, she, so she called the religions of India Sanatan, uh, but she borrowed from Buddhism. It's not an Indian name. So Hindu scriptures don't describe their faith as Hinduism. Yoga, uh, not, not, not yoga, Tantra. Tantra was the state religion in the Hindu kingdoms. The so Hindu kingdoms didn't have Hinduism as, as India's religion, uh, but Tantra was, but, but Tantra itself is not an uh, Aryan concept or an Aryan religious tradition. It is a um, pre Aryan from Harappan. Uh, uh, Indus Valley civilization, the concept of Tantra came, which both the tradition of Tantra, uh, which uh, are in Greek Gnosticism, uh, they're, they're very similar. So that concept of Tantra, which was actually the state religion in all the Hindu states, or most of the Hindu states, uh, this was um, uh, embraced um, uh, but it's a, a sort of little embarrassing still. It may not be tomorrow, but as of today, it is still embarrassing to, for a Hindu to describe himself as a tantric. Um, when, when we were young um, teenagers, a tantra was a dirty word. So our mothers, when they want to uh, want us to behave, they will say that, you know, don't go out on the streets because there are tantrics. They'll kidnap you. 
So they kidnap, they, they sacrifice, uh, they abuse. So uh, Tantra was a dirty word. Uh, uh, when we were growing up, it became a respectable word only after the hippie movement uh, took it and be began to uh, describe it. So Osho Rajneesh was the first one who really brought it out into public, although uh, Swami Vivekananda and Gandhi were practicing uh, tantrics. But uh, leaving that part aside, which I've discussed in many videos, uh, the, the fact this name controversy, the summary of that, the reason I've gone into this rabbit trail, is that if the BJP or Hindutva movement wants to change the name from India to Bharat, Bharat was never the name of the uh, South Asia or the land that is now called India. Bharat is an epic. It, it was a short epic which grew into Mahabharat, which is the long epic by a lot of shlokas being added, a lot of stories and uh, being added to Bharat. It became Mahabharat. Are there three or four individuals in Indian history who were named Bharat? Yes, they are. But they have nothing, none of them ever ruled whole of India and their kingdom was never called Bharat. So yes, there are three or four individuals who are called Bharat uh, but they, were, they never ruled the land of India. Uh, the land of India was never called Bharat. So th this is why the Constituent Assembly could not ad adopt the name Bharat. It was proposed that we should the, the, the Constitution should call the nation Bharat, that is India. But after much debate, they voted that no, India, that is Bharat, because uh, one, there was problem from the South Indian members of the Constituent Assembly. They saw it as imposition of Hindi. Uh, few uh, 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 concepts and names because India had never been called Bharat. Um, and uh, of course, there, was, there never was a nation called India. But now suppose that BJP wants to change the constitution, remove the word secular, remove the word socialist, uh, remove the name India, and uh, remove the concept of independent judiciary uh, or independent election commission, etc. These should all be arms of the executive, the prime minister. Then you have to, you, you cannot bring about these constitutional changes uh, without first destroying uh, the, the present structure. So a civil war is necessary to impose emergency throughout the constitution, appoint a new constituent assembly and change the constitution. Now, Pakistan has changed its constitution many times. A lot of countries keep changing their constitutions many times. And the India has now reached a point where a fresh debate is inescapable. We might choose to stick with the constitution that we have, uh, and uh, learn to make it work. It is not working uh, at the moment uh, uh, in many important respects, sadly, but we might choose to go back, but obviously with the polarization of public opinion, sentiments uh, and enthusiasms that has happened, uh, India has reached that point where it has become unavoidable. Now, so to have to rethink, so this, this would be the conflict between India and NDA. Uh, NDA cannot win democratically through normal democratic election. It will have to win uh, through violence, through a civil war, through an emergency. Uh, and this would be very costly. I mean, there are mainstream churches, cathedrals, 
uh, in Delhi, in Bombay, uh, all over. Uh, they think that we're not baptizing any Hindus. Uh, we don't have any problem. It is these Pentecostals who are frontline evangelists who are converting. Uh, they are being persecuted. They are being tortured by the police and thrown into prison. And the courts are courts are not giving bails to these people. And the uh, chief justice has complained that there are uh, at least five thousand bail applications pending before the Supreme Court. These applications should have been disposed of at the lower level, but. The judges at the lower level have become too scared to uh, uh, give a bail to an evangelist uh, because if he gives the bail to an evangelist, uh, the Hindutva forces will kill the judge's children, rape his wife. So the judges have been scared at the grassroots level, and that's why these cases are pending in the Supreme Court. This is uh, the state of the nation, which is um, the Chief Justice is saying that the climate of fear that Modi government, that Hindutva government has created. Um, so why has, why has India degenerated to this level? That is the question. And this is obviously the challenge of the India Research Group of Bless India Movement, that how do we disciple the nations one, once again? The nation can be discipled. Light can overcome darkness. We do not need to be pessimists. Um, you know, if, if you happen to believe that, uh, that God himself has um, uh, authorized the Antichrist to come and rule India, uh, then, uh, then that's happening now in Manipur, that the Antichrist is ruling. Uh, but should darkness rule or can the light overcome? This question of optimism and pessimism is a very important question. The, it is a corruption of evangelical Christianity that evangelical Christianity has become uh, the most pessimistic um, worldview in America. Uh, and in much of Europe, that no, 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 Antichrist is coming. We are going to be raptured. We are not called to disciple nations. We are called to save individual souls. This whole mindset that has uh, brought us to this sorry state, uh, including in Canada, this all of this needs to be reconsidered, re-examined. What does the Bible teach? Will the light overcome? Can India be discipled again, although the church started all of the education movement in India and handed it over to the secular government? And as the government becomes Hindutva, now Hindutva takes over the education, Ministry of Education uh, that the church brought to India, starting with people like William Carey, Alexander Duff, uh, Charles Trevelyan, etc., you know, the, all of the great uh, movement. Uh, of Christian colleges and Christian schools. But uh, coming back to the issue of what really has killed the conscience. First point, if you dissect human body, human brain, human heart, there is no physical organ in human body. There is no gland in human brain that is called conscience. Conscience is an aspect of biblical view of what a human being is as a living soul made in God's image. God's voice, sense of right and wrong, sense of morality, which is born in us. Now, it could be corrupted to the point that we can believe that it is my moral duty to kill uh, someone from another tribe. So many of the people in Manipur 100 years ago were headhunters uh, who, who became Christian. So to kill someone of the other tribe, hang his head to decorate my hut shows how big a person I am, how many enemies I have killed. Uh, so, so this was corruption of conscience 
which was transformed by evangelism, by the gospel, by education, that no, we must love our enemies. We must serve our enemies, not kill them, not headhunt them, uh, not decorate. The glory is in washing the feet of my enemies, uh, those who are going to betray me, those who are going to desert me, um, uh, serving them, loving them. That's the glory of the cross. Uh, this was what began to transform the Northeast. And uh, we're not doing that today, uh, but uh, the, the first point with regard to conscience is that Conscience is a philosophical idea, a metaphysical idea, a theological idea. It is not an organ in human body. So if a non-Christian doesn't believe in conscience, uh, no, it doesn't mean that he doesn't have a conscience. He has a conscience. If he is, in fact, made in God's image, he has a conscience. But that conscience is silenced. Second, practical reason. So the first is a philosophical reason that conscience is a peculiarly biblical idea. Second, conscience uh, is you become a slave of sin. That's what has happened to Indian police force. They've become slaves of sin. Now, I experienced it firsthand in 1980 when the superintendent of police told me to my face, that he respects me very highly. Uh, no one has done in my, his district what I've been doing for the poor. Uh, there is no one in, in his district who is an internationally published, unrespected author. He said that I haven't read your book, but I've read The World of Gurus, but I've read the reviews, etc. But he went on to say that, look, although I respect you personally, I have a 300 page file on you. I know everything that you're doing. Um, but I will personally kill you if you do not cancel that Wednesday prayer meeting. And that Wednesday prayer meeting was not in a church. It was not a sectarian meeting. Gandhi Ashram had invited me to organize a prayer meeting for relief to the victims of hailstone. So it was a public prayer meeting where all people like in Gandhian style, everybody would come to seek God uh, for relief for the victims of hailstone. And uh, the uh, Hindu politicians realized that what I was doing would lead to mass conversions, and therefore they got the district magistrates to ban. We we stopped the relief work, but we didn't stop the prayer meeting. The SP told me that he would personally kill me if uh, I didn't cancel the prayer meeting. Uh, he, 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 he said that, look, I'm not going to arrest you. I'm not going to get a warrant or produce you before a magistrate. I will come to your home, take you from your home, take you into the jungle, shoot you, throw your body. Hyenas will eat you. Lagrabagdas will eat you. Uh, are you going to cancel that prayer meeting? So I said to him, I, I didn't believe him. So I said to him that, look, I'll have to ask my wife if she is willing to be a widow before I can make that decision. He realized that I was not taking him seriously. So he spent an hour telling me how many innocent people he had actually killed. So here is the superintendent of police telling me that he's a murderer, extrajudicial murders. I still didn't believe him because I thought that, that he was a gazetted officer who had taken an oath uh, of office to uphold the constitution of India, which guarantees my right to inalienable right to life, that he cannot possibly do this. Uh, but in fact, what we are seeing uh, after that, of course, uh, I became a little wiser during the Punjabi emergency, where people like Jeth Malani began to tell everybody how many innocent Punjabi young people uh, the police officers had killed uh, or threatened to kill to extort money from their families, and that every police officer had become multimillionaire. Uh, so it was only when these things became very public in Punjab that the power that the emergency had given to the police was being used to turn these police officers into multimillionaires through extrajudicial killings, through financial extortion of innocent families, because which is what created or fueled this Khalistani movement. Um, 
but we we won't go into more of those details but the the what i learned when they finally didn't kill me but threw me in jail what i learned was that this police officer who genuinely respects me he can at least throw me in jail if necessary he can kill me why because not because he disrespects me or hates me but because the local MLA is telling him to stop me, kill me. Why is he listening to a criminal who has become an MLA? He knows that this man was used to be a criminal because Arjun, before Arjun Singh gave him a ticket and he got elected on Congress a ticket as a Congress MLA. Uh, why does this uh, SP obey a criminal who has become an MLA. Well, he does because SP has been taking bribes. SP has been collecting bribes for MLAs, for ministers, for chief ministers. Once the SP, superintendent of police, has been, uh, has compromised with corruption, taken bribes, then he has become very vulnerable. If he doesn't listen to the MLA, he will lose his job. He will get a punishment posting far away from his wife and children. He can get arrested. There'll be plenty of people MLA can get to give witness that this SP has bribed. And chief minister will make sure that the SP get arrested because the chief minister uh, under Rajiv Gandhi, under Indira Gandhi, uh, needs the support of Congress MLAs. So corruption is a practical issue. Jesus says that those who sin become a slave of sins. So the police force in India has become slave of sin by participating in corruption during the Congress time and much more during the BJP time. So understanding that the sin leads to slavery and these police force and the military force increasingly are not there to defend our freedom. They are there to make us slaves of sin. Uh, this is what uh, the non-Christian worldview, educational philosophy has done to India. But more than that, is the religious philosophy, and that's the point of the film Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer is really uh, concerned. You know, the film, film is very boring, uh, but uh, by September 11th, it has already won 800, earned $890 million, and uh, they are saying that it will cross a billion dollars, the boring film. In India, it won by August 18th, that's a month ago. It had earned 127 crores, while Barbie, which was released at the same time, had earned only 53 crores. So Barbie had made 53 crores. Um, this is a month ago. So uh, it is a super hit in India, the film uh, Oppenheimer, in spite of a very boring film. It has a sex scene. Well, a few sex scenes uh, that inject some uh, interest into the film. But it is actually at the end of the uh, sex scene when his naked girlfriend pick, picks up the copy of Bhagavad Gita and brings to him and opens where he already had a bookmark and asks, this is in Sanskrit, she asks him to read a shloka and explain it to him. And... Um, uh, that's a shloka in which Krishna is saying to Arjun that you should kill. Uh, Arjun has a conflict of conscience. Hastinapur is a fight for five little villages made of mud huts. It is worth killing my cousins, killing my uncles, teachers, uh, friends for the sake of these five villages. Is this war worth it? And Krishna is giving him a philosophy which is saying that, look, it is not for you 
to make moral decisions. Your conscience is irrelevant. You have to do your duty. You are born in a Chatriya caste. You are a superintendent of police. You have to obey the civil servant, the MLA. He's telling you to kill Vishal Mangalwadi. You go and kill. It's not important that you live according to your conscience. Uh, that's basically what Arj Krishna is saying to Arjuna. That I'm God. I'm everything. I am death. I am destruction. If there is no transcendent God, and Oppenheimer is a liberal Jew who doesn't really believe in the Jewish God, who is above the cosmos, who commands human beings that you shall not kill. If God is part of the cosmos, if everything is God, then both life and death come from God. There is no sovereign God who is good, a transcendent God who is good. All the death and destruction is God. So individual conscience is irrelevant, immaterial. You have to silence your conscience, do your duty. So what Bhagavad Gita did to Oppenheimer is what it did to Arjuna. Forget your conscience, do your duty irrespective of the cons consequences, kill. Now, of course, the Dravidian interpretation of uh, the Bhagavad Gita or Ramayana, Mahabharata is that Krishna, in our, some of the early Vedic literature, uh, Krishna is an uh, indigenous, a Dravidian uh, ruler of Yadav community, the Gopal, who look after the cows. Aryans are coming and becoming are troublesome in North India, in Doab, which is the land between Yamuna and Ganga, they're becoming troublesome. So both the Kauravs, 100 brothers, Pandavs, five brothers, they go to Krishna. You have the army. Please support us in this war that we are going to fight. So Krishna gives his army to Duryodhan, to the, to the Kauravs. He joined himself, Pandavs. Now, he's basically encouraging the Aryans to fight and kill each other. Uh, and he's giving rationale to Arjuna why he should kill the Kauravs. Uh, let the Aryans fight and kill and destroy each other. Th this is the Dravidian interpretation of Mahabharata, that Krishna is uh, encouraging the civil war uh, amongst the cousins uh, because uh, he obviously knows that if he is the charioteer of Arjuna, his army is with Duryodhan. His army is not going to attack Arjuna. His army is not going to attack him. Uh, uh, but there will be good fight. They will help destroy each other. And then uh, the native people will have peace. So this is the um, OBC, back, Dalit backward caste interpretation of what's actually happening in Mahabharata and what Krishna is doing. Uh, but then Vedvyas uh, takes uh, Krishna's message and um, uh, he injects casteism. He puts uh, Aryan casteism into Krishna's mouth that you're born a Kshatriya, you do your duty, which is to kill. If you're born a sweeper, you do your duty to sweep. You don't try and become a professor or a dentist. So, so you're teaching casteism, uh, but because Krishna is a popular uh, native Dravidian, uh, non-Aryan hero, uh, you use him to promote caste system. That's the deconstructionist interpretation of Mahabharata and Bhagavad Gita, but we don't need to go into that. The important point is that the ultimate consequence of Bhagavad Gita is that Krishna should not, I mean, Arjuna should not take the voice of his conscience seriously. He must do his duty. He must, his, his social order, his caste system must overrule his individual conscience. So he is not free to say that, no, my caste is wrong. My people are wrong. 
I'm not going to participate in this uh, unnecessary uh, uh, war, etc. So uh, this philosophy, which is part of monism, part of pantheism, if everything is God, life is God, death is God. Krishna is saying, I am death. So, so there is no transcendent God who is saying that, no, it's the enemy who comes to steal and kill and destroy. I have come to give life an abundant life. That there is a transcendent God who is the source of life. Yes, there is evil. Yes, there is war. Yes, there is death and destruction. But this is not God's will. This is against God's will. So, yes, Bhagavad Gita helps Oppenheimer get rid of his Jewish conscience because conscience begins in the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve realize that they have disobeyed God. There is a God who has given a command, don't eat this fruit. We've disobeyed him. Now we are guilty, so we are trying to hide. We are trying to cover ourselves with fig leaves. So the concept of conscience begins in uh, Genesis 3, but it's in Paul's letters that conscience really becomes an important issue that ultimately religion is not a matter of observing the legalism of Judaism, of sacrifices, special day, Sabbath, and not eating this, not touching that. This is not religion. A real religion is circumcision of the heart keeping your conscience pure, being responsible uh, to God's voice within you because his Holy Spirit must come dwell in you, uh, lead you. It is liberty from legalism, but it is conformity to God, to his law, his character, his word, uh, and you becoming godlike. So this is what begins at the heart of the Reformation when Martin Luther declares that I'm not going to conform to the church, to the bishop, to the pope, to the emperor. My conscience is captive to the word of God. Uh, the word of God is refining my conscience. And if, I'm, I've, if Jesus is my Lord, I'm free from the ultimate authority of the emperor. I'm free from the ultimate authority of the pope and of the church. and. Uh, I have joined, I have become a citizen of God's kingdom. He's my father. He's in me. He's ruling me. I'm going to obey him. If it means that I'm burnt at stake, so be it. So the doctrine of conscience sets Luther free. And this becomes to the heart of the conflict between the Protestant reformers and the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and finally, it takes a bloody civil war in England. Uh, I mean, many wars have happened in Europe, but ultimately the civil war in England, which uh, Oliver Cromwell, the Puritans, win and appoint the Westminster Assembly, which uh, writes the Westminster Confession. If the Bible is God's word, if this is the ultimate authority, what does the Bible teach? That's what so that's summary the creed. So Westminster Confession is the creed which the parliament adopts. And, it, and the whole chapter in Westminster Confession is devoted to the doctrine of conscience. That conscience is God's voice. State has to respect the conscience. If an individual is saying that this war is unjust, state cannot draft that individual to fight a war. State can still draft him to serve the victims of a war, to do social service, medical service, and other things, but the state cannot force a man to go against his conscience because his conscience sets him free. Now, this doctrine of conscience is the reason why the press in England became the first pre free press in history. Uh, I, in some of my books, that, such as India, The Grand Experiment, I have discussed the origin of free press. If Modi government, BJP government, has killed the conscience of the press, if press has become Godi media, 
that is not free in India anymore. That is because the modern press was born in England uh, after the Cromwell government fell, Anglican government came back, monarchy came back. Uh, some of the uh, pastors who had become Puritans, they were Anglicans, but they had become Puritans. Uh, they, uh, well, <laughs> thank you. I will uh, close with this last point that uh, we're seeing that the press in India is no longer free press. It's Modi, Modi, Godi media. It, it's slave press. 90% uh, of the press is owned by Adani and Ambani. Uh, how have these very sophisticated, very capable, very well-educated uh, journalists in India uh, become slaves? So what happened in England, the birth of free press was that these Puritan Anglican preachers began to preach from their pulpits that the court is wrong, the king is wrong, the bishop is wrong, the church is wrong, when there they were genuine biblical objections to the rulings that were being given by the parliament, etc. So the bishops defrocked these priests that you're not allowed to preach anymore your license is withdrawn. Then these Puritan preachers began to write their point of views. If I'm not allowed to preach, I can write and publish. They began to be persecuted for what they were writing and publishing. So the ears were cut, nose would be cut, head would be chopped off. But because what they were writing was being read and was being believed and they were sealing their testimony with their blood. That's how the freedom of press was one that people began to believe the press instead of believing the Pope or the Bishop or the Emperor or the court or the parliament. That's how the freedom of press was won and the press became the fourth state. So constitution, a giving freedom of press or the law giving the freedom of the press doesn't keep the press free. It is the conscience of the individual. Now, this is what has happened to Ravish Kumar and others who have resigned from NDTV and from other Godi media uh, to become independent voices with the freedom to say exactly what they want to say. Uh, they may be wrong in some places. They're not right in everything. They may have vested interest. Um, the, the, they're taking revenge against Adani for having bought NDTV, etc. All of those human factors are possible. But uh, the point that commitment to conscience that I'm going to say what I believe is right and true, this is what gave press freedom. This is what gave human rights. This is what gave uh, real political freedom, um, uh, as I've mentioned in another lecture, that Luther's sermon in Marburg on two kingdoms, that the emperor has some authority over me, bishop has some authority over me, church has some authority over me, but my heart belongs to Jesus. He is my Lord. He is my king. Lordship of Christ abolishes the lordship of man. It sets me free from the kingdom of Satan. So this biblical doctrine of conscience is the source of modern freedom. Conscience is what is killed, not just by corruption, by sin, but by philosophy, by Bhagavad Gita. That's the message of Oppenheimer. And it's not just that Oppenheimer's conscience was killed by Gita. It is that Hindutva's conscience is killed. That's why Hindutva has no respect for the British law and all the legal uh, agreements that India has signed with the United Nations, that we will not send murderers into Canada to kill people we disagree with or who disagree with us and who criticize us. So if India has to become free again, the church has to disciple the nation. The church has to educate the nation. The church has to teach the doctrine of conscience, purity of conscience, which you, when you 
accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you enter the kingdom of God. You are now free from the kingdom of corrupt MLAs and MPs and PMs. Uh, you are free to obey God, walk with God, love God, serve God. That's freedom. Uh, Jesus said, if you abide in my word, that's what Luther is saying, that my conscience is captive to the word of God. If you abide in my word, you will know the truth. The truth will set you free. If the son shall set you free, whoever sins is a slave of sin. If the son shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. So, so the American gospel, which you accept Jesus, you go to heaven. That's not what Jesus is saying in John 8. Jesus is saying that whoever sins is a slave of sin and you are not slaves of Rome. You Jews are slaves of sin. The, I have come as the sa savior from sin. If I set you free from your sin, you shall be free indeed. That's how freedom came to the West. That's how freedom came to India. We don't know these things because our seminaries never teach that the biblical doctrine of conscience not the constitution, is the source of freedom. So could India experience a terrible uh, gladiator games? Yes. Rome had become a culture without conscience, where conscience had been suppressed. Consequently, when the popularity of a Roman Caesar's uh, took a low ebb when Caesar became unpopular because of hunger, unemployment, um, abuse, etc. Uh, Caesars would organize gladiator games. That's what Vishwa Hindu Parishad is trying to do to bring five crore people to Ayodhya to inaugurate Ram Mandir. Caesars would organize large-scale violence to win popularity. Is that possible in India? Satpal Malik is saying that they can do anything. This is what Nietzsche had said. This is what fascism had said. This is what Hitler practiced. That more Jews we kill the enemy by painting them as enemies, more we kill six million of them, more powerful and popular we become. And India is headed in that because both our philosophy and our corruption has killed our conscience, silenced our conscience. Our police force, which is supposed to protect our rights, protect our freedom, has become slaves of sin. India needs the savior. India needs Jesus who will save us from sin. But first, he's got to save us from evangelical theology, which does not understand any of this. Uh, which has no message of freedom for the nation. That's the heart of India Research a Project and the Bless India Movement. And I stop there. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vishal. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's time for a moderated Q&A. Uh, would uh, any of you like to ask any questions? You don't have to come on camera, you can just ask. Well, hello, this is Bharat from Hyderabad. I have a question. Can I go ahead? Yes. Yes, please. please. Uh, well, hello, Vishal. Sir, I've been, I've been seeing your work from past few days. And uh, I think uh, you're an Indologist, by the way, uh, as an Indian historian. So uh, my question is that there is this theory called Aryan invasion theory or Aryan migration theory, which is the base for uh, the Dravidianism. That's what these uh, uh, Hindu fundamentalists claim, that that is not the uh, truth. Well, is it true or not? Aryan migration theory or invasion theory? Well, the language of Arya and Anarya. Aryas and Rakshas. 
this is Vedic language, this is Upanishadic language, whether the Harappan civilization, Mohanjadaro and Harappa were actually destroyed by Aryan invasion or whether they were destroyed by floods is an open question. Archaeologists and other researchers have to research it, whether the uh, invaders came and destroyed the Indus Valley civilization. It's quite possible that the floods destroyed cities that were villages that were built near the river. Uh, that's a possibility. But the language of Aryan, Aryan, Anarya, uh, and the native people being Vanarsena, uh, Hanuman, um, so, so the, 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 that is very clearly a part of Hindu scriptures. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> There is a question asked uh, on the chat box earlier, Dr. Vishal, since the local police was against you, how were you able to get the clearance from local police to apply for passport, visa, etc.? Well, actually for five, six years, I had no passport uh, and no visa. Um, but uh, thankfully, uh, things changed and uh, this was an advantage relative advantage that it was Congress in power at that time. Uh, and so the, the, Arjun Singh was not really against me. And I had some good friends who were friends of Arjun Singh. One of them was head of Bhasha with the Vedic, uh, who was head of Bhasha, um, quite influential. So, so there was no animosity. And I wasn't an enemy of the Congress MLAs either. Uh, they were uh, opposing me, yes, but um, uh, but in today's situation, I would have been killed. But but back then, uh, things were better. But, but uh, basically, if if Congress India came to power, all the criminal elements who are with BJP right now, they will become Congress members. So, so, so the people like Rahul Gandhi, Kharge would have to be very careful if they are fundamentally changing the Congress party and ethos or whether they are opening their doors for all the criminals to migrate from one party to the other party. Uh, thank you. Uh, I hope that answered your question. And as... Uh... There's another question on the chat box. If this is a hypothetical question, um, as somebody who is not knowing much about the Khalistani movement, if India can demand independence from England, why can't Punjab not demand their own independence? That's a legitimate question, and that question applies to Kashmir. Uh, why can't the two Kashmiris, Pakistan occupied and India occupied Kashmir, become one and become an independent nation. And that applies to Northeast. Uh, the, no, that uh, why can't some of the Northeastern states become independent of India? So, and that applies to South India as well now. That if and this was this is why the Hindu Hindi movement that was led by Jan Sang, Vajpayee, etc., uh, that Hindi should be national language. Uh, if Hindi is imposed on South India, Hinduism is imposed upon South India, and that we are a Hindu Rashtra. Would there be a secessionist movement in South India? So keeping. Uh, India together, India is a divided, uh, we are a federal country. So we were lots of little kingdoms, uh, 600, 560 little kingdoms. Uh, we, be, we got organized around linguistic states. So all the Oriya speaking people are part of Odisha and all the Telugu speaking people are part of Andhra now, Andhra and Telangana or Malayalam. 
so this big transformation of India that uh, 560, 70 uh, states becoming uh, linguistic states organized around language and administrative facility. Uh, this is because of Genesis 11, that nations were divided according to languages. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, you know, n n people don't talk about it, people don't recognize it, uh, that uh, in India, uh, we have very consciously organized ourselves as federal government. Now, Bollywood has helped a lot in promoting Hindi, uh, that Hindi is understood not just in India, but outside of India, uh, because of popularity of Bollywood films. And, uh, and, and that's good because language is integrating the nation, uh, but Hindi is not yet capable of being the language of law the language of research, the language of science, uh, and therefore in the parliament, you have to allow uh, people to communicate in other languages. Uh, but the fact that people like Rahul Gandhi and uh, Kharge are speaking in English, in Hindi, is a good thing uh, for the nation, uh, for Hindi to be able to replace English as a full-fledged uh, language for us, for the nation is a, will be a good thing because it means that a child who is a good scientist, he doesn't have to first study English or German or uh, Latin to become a scientist. He can, with the knowledge of Hindi alone, he can become a good scientist, etc. So, um, how? but how do you unite a divided nation? We are a divided nation because we were never a nation. We have we became a nation in nineteen in eighteen fifty eight after the great revolt. Um, we became a nation initially as a colonized nation, uh, but eighteen fifty eight is when India was born as a nation, and then in nineteen forty seven we became a free nation. In nineteen fifty we became a republic where we chose our own uh, constitution, etc. But that um, constitution was not written entirely by a constituent assembly. At least 70% of it had been written by British civil servants as India Act of 1935. India Act of 1935, based on which there was 1937 election in which Nehru became the prime minister. So Nehru became prime minister of India 10 years before the independence as a result of India Act of 1937. Now, most of us don't remember any of those things, uh, but, uh, but so the law, con one constitution united us. And this is where uh, the American theology has done a lot of damage in suggesting that nation means people group. No. Uh, God is saying to Abraham, I'll make you a great nation. You will be father of many nations. Kings of the nations will come through you. Israel is 13 tribes, 13 people groups, one nation united under one law. So what unites a nation is not ethnicity, but a common law, a constitution. So that's very much a Jewish idea, which was hammered out um, in France by the French Huguenots, the modern constitutionalism was the, the philosophy of it was articulated by the Huguenots, the French Calvinists, and first implemented in Scotland. But, um, but that's a part of history that we don't need to go into it. So the issue is what will keep India together is one constitution. If the Hindutva is saying that, no, we will throw out this constitution because these concepts are not Indian concepts. We will have a Hindu Rashtra run on the basis of Hindu scriptures, Sanatana scriptures. With the, the, there never was. The Hindu scripture is the reason why India is divided uh, into castes 
uh, and Aryas and Anaryas. So Hinduism is a divisive system which cannot unite India. This <clears throat> the modern idea of many people groups speaking many different languages, such as Switzerland are united by one constitution under one law. This is what God says to Abraham in Genesis 18, that Abraham will surely become a great nation because he will teach his children and his household, his ethnic and his non-ethnic, to walk in my ways, to do what is just, what is right, etc. So uh, this understanding of constitutionalism, uh, that it is the law, and th th this is where, once again, I repeat this, um, uh, that American theology has done a tremendous damage to global Christianity, uh, that even today, there are nine judges in the Supreme Court of America. Eight of them are Jews and Roman Catholics. The last one, Mrs. Jackson, is a lapsed Protestant. Um, but all of them went to uh, Puritan law colleges in um, Harvard and Yale. Puritan biblical Christianity gave the law and legal system. But about 100 years ago, dispensationalism um, said that we don't live in the uh, dispensation of law. We live in the dispensation of grace. Therefore, we should not be teaching law. We should be teaching grace, the Holy Spirit, uh, salvation, etc. So none of the evangelical institutions of higher learning, beginning with Moody Bible Institute, um, Wheaton College, Dallas, Biola, Fuller, none of them had law uh, training uh, as though by their Bible Institute, and they're not teaching law as the Bible has nothing to say to law. And uh, none of them have law faculties even today. And all our Bible seminaries have followed that tradition that we are not teaching law. So we, God is saying Abraham will become a great nation by teaching his law uh, to his children and his non-children. Uh, but the evangelical movement, which created the law system, and we have uh, Priya Aristotle with us, a Supreme Court lawyer, online uh, right now. Uh, she's written her uh, chapters on constitution and Indian law, that these are biblical ideas that came to India. But during the last 100 years, um, the Union um, Biblical Seminary, Yot Mal Pune, uh, none of the evangelical seminaries, not even SIEX, has a faculty of law. And this has got to change. If we have to disciple nation, uh, we have to be the ones to teach the biblical law to the nation. And uh, this is what was happening in the Fort William College. The civil servants, the police officers, were being trained, educated in the Bible. That's why the Bible was being translated to teach police officers how to govern the nation, to teach magistrates how to govern the nation. So this whole theological movement that we have, the seminary movement, um, is a problem. Um, and we have got to reform it. Uh, we've got to critique it that Christianity has lost America. Christianity has lost Europe. It has lost Canada because of Bible seminaries, because they're not biblical. They are a particular corruption of biblical theology. And this, this has got to be uh, reformed if we have to disciple the nation. Thank you. A question on YouTube chat. Michael Jabaraj says, do you think revival and great awakening could be God's agenda to transform the nations in our days? A wonderful question. That's exactly what is going to happen. So I am saying that Satpal Malik and um, Uddhav Thakre are right. We can expect a lot of trouble. We can expect an uh, emergency and we can expect constitution being thrown on, uh, attempt no. being made. Uh, but at the end of it, yeah. what is really going to happen is what um, 
Udayanidhi, Stalin has said that people are going to reject um, uh, Sanatan Dharm, Hindu Dharm, Tantra, big time. Uh, Mayavati has said that she will convert uh, with crores of people to Buddhism. Now, everybody knows that that will be just a political drama. She is not a Buddhist. Uh, before starting DS4 and Bahujan Samaj Party, Kanchiram had already started a Buddhist research uh, foundation in Karolbag in Delhi. And he studied Buddhism because he was an Ambedkarite and he rejected Buddhism. Mayavati rejected Buddhism as uh, uh, useless and unsatisfactory for India. So, uh, but, but if Mayavati does co convert to Buddhism in a big way, uh, Th th that will be to put her place in the Buddhist Dalit history in India. Uh, uh, what the good it will do is to uh, uh, make the concept of conversion acceptable, uh, popularize the concept of conversion, because if she converts to Buddhism, there will be no bloodshed um, uh, as of today. But... Uh, it will popularize the concept of conversion that yes, Sanatan Dharma, Hindu Dharma must be ended uh, and the people should get out of Hinduism. Uh, so the question is that do I foresee uh, church growth, revival, great awakening? Yes, I do. And I think it is very possible that uh, states such as uh, Tamil Nadu, uh, Andhra, Telangana, Punjab, uh, these will become the first states uh, with Christian majority in mainland India. And I think UP, Bihar, uh, MP, Rajasthan, they will not be far behind. And we can expect that all the persecution, when Yogi government persecutes Christians in UP, uh, yogi government is simply telling all the relatives of the pastors, evangelists who are be, being beaten up and thrown into prison unjustly. The yogi government is saying that Hinduism is oppressive uh, and Hinduism is unjust. Uh, Hinduism is bad for India. That's the message that yogi government is giving to the masses in UP and it will reap the consequences of that. Uh, big time. So I, I expect uh, a religious explosion in UP because of high-handed oppressive nature of Hindu government in UP. Um, uh, and and th th will this be superficial? Um, religious conversion? No. Mayavati's conversion to Buddhism will be a superficial political stunt. But these people who are turning to Christ, the grassroots in UP, they are really experiencing Jesus. They are seeing healings, deliverance from demons, a healing of sicknesses, even resurrections that uh, as a result of simple, illiterate women praying by faith, uh, dead are being raised death uh, to, to life. So th there will be a genuine Relig religious experience at the grassroots. This is what happened in Tamil Nadu in the 1960s uh, when uh, the DMK, the Dravidian movement overthrew the Congress party, which was a Brahmanical party controlled by Brahmins and Banyas. Uh, Rahul Gandhi is trying to change that. And I think he's being sincere. And this is, um, he has understood the failure of Nehru and Indira Gandhi and Rajiv Gandhi, uh, is, uh, and he's trying to change, which is a good thing. Uh, but he will have to uh, come around and implicitly support what uh, Stalin is saying, that the problem is not BJP. BJP is your political rival. The problem is Sanatan Dharma. Uh, and uh, Rahul Gandhi will have to um, implicitly uh, agree to that and support that. Karge will have to. Uh, if Karge doesn't support conversion, uh, he will not be accepted as a Dalit leader because he's no longer Ambedkarite. Uh, he, he's uh, a Dalit face of a uh, Brahminical party. That's how Mayavati will paint him. So Karge 
I mean, he may not become open and he should not become open. He should keep the election should be fought on unemployment and hunger and inflation and uh, poverty and um, freedom of press and uh, freedom of institutions such as ED and election commission and judiciary. Yes, this should be the political issues over which the election is fought. But ultimately, uh, a leader like Nitish Kumar or Akhilesh Yadav and uh, Malikarjun Kharge, they cannot uh, get away from Ambedkar's analysis that what India needs is conversion. Thank you. Uh, um, there is an interesting question from Ren, Ren Lamo from Nagaland. Will it be fair to say that there are certain overlapping aspects between dispensationalism and Gnosticism? Spirituality at the expense of the corporeal, souls at the expense of the nation. Uh, yes, a related question is, uh, somebody else asked uh, in the beginning is, when will all this end, uh, you know, when Jesus, would this end when Jesus returns? Um, Jesus is ready to come today. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open the door, I will come in. So Jesus will come in as we invite him. Uh, and that is what will make us rulers. One of the, my favorite verses is Revelation 3.21, which we were never taught to memorize in Sunday school or EU. Uh, the reason Jesus wants to come into our heart and sit on the throne of our heart is because he wants us to sit on his throne. In verse 21, he says, if you let me sit on the throne of your heart, I will let you sit on my throne as I have sat down on my father's throne. So Jesus is ruler. He's sitting on God's throne. He wants us to sit on his throne. Because to be a child of God means to be a ruler. You are son of king, king of, he's king of kings. That means that you are king. So when will the kingdom of God come? When we allow Jesus to rule the world through our hearts. Sovereignty uh, belongs to him and to his children. His children shall reign. So the, the, we are responsible to make sure that God's will is being done in India. Uh, this is what the foolishness of dispensationalism has undermined. That no, 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 no. We are the useless body of Christ. This is what dispensationalism has said. That the, his useful body is sitting in heaven. Uh, the, on earth is his useless body. He is the head of this body, yes. Uh, but 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 this is his useless body. Only when his uh, real body comes uh, from heaven, then uh, there will be change on this earth. Uh, so, so this is what the American theology has told us for 100 years. Uh, but is the church the useless body of Christ? Or is the church the body of Christ uh, that we were slaves, we have become sons, to be priests and kings, that should his will be done on earth in India through us. So uh, a few missionaries, few visionaries came and they changed India. So you must uh, begin to read the books such as William Carey, The Father of Modern India. And the, the book is now available um, and um, from trias.com. Uh, and a whole series of books are coming. At least 15 books are coming now. We are hoping to publish one book a month. So please uh, read these books. They will challenge the established theology and established preachers. Uh, but it, it, a, a reformation is a conf confrontation. It is a quarrel with the existing view of what things are. So uh, but but, but to, to go back to the question before that, I was what I was saying was that in 1960s, when the uh, Anadurai, the Dravidian ideas overthrew the Congress Party, uh, 
there was massive religious conversions that happened in Tamil Nadu. Some of it was superficial, but a lot of it was genuine. And out of that genuine movement came the missionary movements, such as Friends Missionary Prayer Band and GEMS and you know, IEM, IEM, which has sown the seeds throughout North India for first uh, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. These movements didn't see much fruit in North India, uh, but from 92, the conversions began. But North India is now ready as a result of all of the seed being sown and all the tremendous prayers that have happened in South India, Andhra, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, um, largely uh, not so much in Karnataka, but uh, because of the tremendous investment in prayer and giving and missionary enterprise. So as North India uh, explodes for the gospel, uh, some of the some of the conversions may be superficial, maybe political, maybe just a rejection of Hinduism rather than real acceptance of Christ as the Lord and Savior. Th those aspects will be there, but there is already a real faith in North India. Uh, in uh, say Allahabad, when I was growing up in Allahabad, Christianity was a tiny urban phenomena around colonial eras churches and in educational institutions. Medical institutions had already been sold, but there were educational institutions which are still there. But today, uh, after 90, uh, 1992, there is not one village in whole of that Eastern UP be uh, belt where there is not at least one family that is Christian. So Christianity has penetrated the gospel has penetrated into villages in North India. And uh, these are praying people. They are being persecuted. Yes, they're being beaten up and imprisoned. Yes, but that very persecution is a demonstration that Hinduism is an oppressive religion. Yogi is an oppressive chief minister. Uh, they can send somebody to kill me here. Yes, that's possible. But um, they are exposing themselves globally. Um, and that's what has happened with this Canada incident. They're exposing themselves globally. And um, uh, Modi got a lot of beating from the Muslims in um, G20, because of which Munu Manesar was arrested uh, immediately. Uh, and uh, and the, 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 this is going to explode in the international press, putting the NRI community, the Hindus, who are very proud of Hinduism in North America and Europe, uh, they will become embarrassed by what's happening. So, so there will, I expect large scale conversions of educated Hindus, even in North America. Um, but the North American church and European church has to be prepared for it, educated for it uh, to, to really speak. So um, I, I've taken a lot of time, it's all, almost two hours now already, uh, but the, the the YouTube question that do I expect a great awakening and a revival? Yes, I do. And I don't think it will be superficial because the Holy Spirit is actually active throughout India, um, particularly in the north. Thank you. Uh, there is a, a follow on question, natural follow on question from Bharat Kumar. Does that mean Jesus is not going to physically return to earth well when when jesus says i stand at the door and knock if any man hear my voice i shall come in what coming is that uh, is is the church his body physical body so this obsession with eschatology is part of the foolishness of Western theology. Why don't you come to terms with Revelation 3.20, that Jesus is ready to come today to make you a ruler. Uh, you read uh, Revelation 3.21. So I, I have written a lot of it. I'm not escaping the question, but uh, on uh, YouTube, I have many videos. On Facebook, I have a lot of discussion 
uh, that uh, that in the book of Revelation alone, Jesus comes seven times, at least seven times. Uh, the idea of coming of Christ in uh, Matthew 10, when Jesus is sending out the 12, he's saying that before you have gone to all the cities and villages in Israel, the Son of Man will come in his glory and power. What coming is he talking about? In Matthew 18 or 16, uh, Jesus says that some of you who are after Peter confesses you are Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus says that there are many standing here who will not taste death before the Son of Man has come in his glory and power. In Matthew 24, this is just Matthew. In Matthew 24, when they ask, when will this temple be destroyed? When, after Jesus has said that not one stone will be left uh, one upon another. Jesus says uh, in Matthew 24 uh, that many of you who are standing here will not taste death until they have seen uh, the Son of Man come in his kingdom, in his glory, in his power. So uh, to, to say that, no, 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 Jesus was not talking about this generation to which his immediate audience, but he was talking about our generation. Uh, this is the dispensationalist uh, mishandling of the scriptures because of which Burton Russell became an atheist that Jesus is saying that he, was come with, he will come within the generation uh, which was his audience. Um, obviously, he didn't know about uh, his coming. Uh, so Jesus was not God. He, he didn't know what he's talking about. Uh, so Burton Russell, who was a mathematician in Cambridge, uh, became an atheist uh, because of the foolishness of the evangelical Christianity which lumped all of these things, the coming of Christ, as uh, one uh, end event. Now, I've written extensively on this, and I'll be glad to do more Bible teaching on uh, this whole question. But basically, uh, this dispensational theology of premillennialism has, it is one of the important factors because of which Christianity has lost America, Europe, and uh, and much has corrupted a lot of uh, what Christianity is all about. So, uh, the, the, the person who has asked the question at the moment, I will just respond to him by asking: When Jesus says, "I stand at the door and knock; if any man open the door, I will come in." What coming is he talking about? Yes, uh, he. I think we will move on to another question. Uh, isn't this in, isn't it a mistake to acknowledge and treat Christianity as a cultural, socio-political, religious identity? Many Christians, as uh, many Christians, would. Uh, I as corrupt as the SP as you mentioned. So isn't it problematic when Christians churches protest Manipur rather than multi-religious secular protests? Uh, that unfortunately is true that um, uh, there is a lot of corruption in the church in India and in the West. Um, yesterday, uh, on Monday, I had lunch with a 80-year-old uh, Christian who went down the list of how many evangelical churches he has been part of where there has been adultery amongst the pastors. And so uh, financial corruption may be less in the Western church because um, uh, the democratic structures of auditing and uh, res responsible financial responsibility is still stronger. But the sexual corruption uh, is uh, more evident. But in India, you have both the sexual corruption uh, of Christian leadership along with the financial corruption, um, which has been rampant, including in the evangelical uh, wing, uh, so when compassion was banned, 
um, I had heard enough stories before Modi government banned compassion that uh, the lot of the schools that compassion was funding were actually only on paper. Uh, they didn't actually exist, but compassion was deceiving donors in the West to collect money uh, to pay for children who, who were uh, being brought only to be given sweets and clothes when uh, somebody is visiting, coming to see, but those schools didn't actually exist. So is there a lot of corruption in the church? Yes, there is a lot of corruption. Is there caste and untouchability in the church in India? Yes, unfortunately, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, untouchability and uh, etc. in in the Indian church. And, uh, and th these are a very sad thing. And this is why we really need a revival and a great awakening. Uh, so, uh, but the, the question is, what will fight and eradicate corruption from India? So, so not whether the corruption is present in the church, but who or what will can fight corruption. The good news is, uh, and we will have a long chapter on this in uh, one of the volumes, How the Bible Created Modern India, that in 1947, when India became free, India received a political system, a judicial system, a uh, administrative system, IAS, ICS, which became IAS, and a police system which was not corrupt. Now, everyone knows from Shashi Tharoor and others that East India Company was very corrupt when it began its rule in Bengal. And that's true, that East India Company be uh, rule became as very corrupt rule. Lord Macaulay, who wrote a very powerful essay on Robert Clive, he said that East India Company was a gang of public robbers. It was the, its rule in Bengal was a rule of evil genie. So people like Shashi Tharoor know a lot about the corruption and exploitation that happened because it was the English people, Christians, who were saying, talking about the corruption of East India Company. That, they, they are the ones who have given us all the information of how corrupt it was. But those people, Christians, did not simply criticize the East India Company. They set out to reform East India Company. Now, we know about the social reform movement that ended uh, infanticide, widow burning, sati, uh, established the widow remarriage and education of girls, etc. We know the Indian impact of the social reform movement, but we don't know how the East India Company itself was reformed. That uh, by the 1850s, um, it, there was hardly any corruption. When Ch Charles Tavenian came as a young civil servant, an evangelical civil servant to Delhi, he was almost killed by his superior English officers in Delhi because they were very corrupt. But he risked his life to fight corruption within East India Company. And that's why Macaulay's sister, Hannah Macaulay, married Trevelyan because as a young man, he became a hero fighting corruption. So East India Company was reformed by the evangelicals. Uh, Peter Drucker, the management guru, uh, he summarizes that most of the civil servants in India were son, second or third sons of poor British pastors. Pastors would send their sons to India to become magistrates, collectors, deputy collectors, police officers, to give a clean government of India to India. So these young men, who many of them single, living alone in a controlling a uh, district. Uh, of uh, thousand villages, they're being tempted. Women are being brought to them by bunyas and other 
uh, royalty. Their families are praying for them. These people will not take bribe. Some of them fell into sin. They will abstain from uh, Im sexual immorality. That is what began to transform India and Indians such as uh, Keshav Chandra Sen, et cetera, began to see that here are these young men from England who are living sexually pure lives, who are not taking any bribes. This is what India needs to be transformed. So the, my point is that the gospel reformed governance in India. So from about 1840 to 1947, India had one of the cleanest governments in the world. And this was one of the biggest um, uh, impact of the evangelical movement upon India. You know, we don't hear any of this um, in our, uh, thank you. Yeah, Peter Drucker is summarizing uh, the book, two volumes, Men Who Rule India, Philip Mason. He's summarizing in, he's using East India Company as a powerful example of good management. And uh, this is something that Shashi Tharoor doesn't know about and doesn't talk about and doesn't acknowledge that it was um, the gospel that gave clean. So the gospel has successfully eradicated corruption from India, from Indian police once. It can do that again if Indian church can be delivered from American Christianity, American theology. We, Indian church can do it again. Uh, if we begin to study the Bible and if we begin to study our history by ourselves and not um, follow the, a, a, an idea of Christianity which has destroyed the American church, which has destroyed Canadian church in Europe. C Canadian Christians are enslaved today um, and they don't love Trudeau any more than Modi loves Trudeau. Um, but um, uh, 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 but a whole, a whole new awakening, a reformation of what is theology, what is the gospel, what is the kingdom of Christ is necessary for the West. And it is necessary from India. Um, and and uh, that's already a very long answer. But it, it, the, the question is, isn't the Indian church corrupt? The answer is yes, it is very corrupt. Many bishops have gone to jail. Many more should go to jail. But gospel remains the only force in all of Indian history that has actually given clean government to India once and not just for a short time, but for more than 120, 130 years, the gospel gave clean government to India. It can do so again if we can be delivered from our Bible seminaries. Thank you. That's a very uh, emphatic statement. Uh, 